Welcome to MalcolmPresents.com with our weekly show of Courtney on Health. And Courtney, well, you, you introduce it, Max. I definitely will. So hi, Courtney, and hi, Malcolm. Uh, and welcome to Courtney on Health, which is a Zoomcast podcast, TikTok, all sorts of things about how to get through uh, these times of kind of crazy stuff with still lingering covid and monkey pox and crazy stuff i don't know but anyway uh, courtney gives tips on nutrition and exercise uh, she's a registered dietitian with a master of science degree in nutrition and applied physiology courtney is an experienced nutritional and health consultant in new york metro area and of course we always go beyond into the universe uh, and and will guide help guide you on a path to wellness and health so Question, is there such a thing as good bacteria when it comes to gut health? We'll just get right into this. Uh, what role do probiotics play when it comes to good or helpful bacteria as, as it affects your gut health? Uh, there are probiotics and supplements and some foods like yogurt. Uh, doctors often suggest them to help with digestive problems. Uh, researchers are trying to figure out exactly how probiotics work and which ones work best for certain health problems. Uh, what do they do? Uh, and, I, and Courtney's going to answer that in a little in a minute. Uh, when you lose good bacteria in your body, for example, after you take antibiotics, probiotics can help replace them. They can help balance your good and bad bacteria to keep your body working the way it should. Uh, we also need to think about prebiotics, which I um, can't wait to hear about those. Prebiotics. And how they Prebiotics and how they work within our system. Uh, many times our stomachs overrule our minds and we wind up probably overeating, doing too much stuff. And then we reach for the pink Pepto bottle. <laughs> uh, so, but Courtney has some great, info uh that will help keep our tummies healthy and happy so get get us started with this what do we need to know about this this really good topic sure yeah well welcome hello to both of you good to see you again so i am um, i know we've touched on probiotics before and gut health but we've spoken about fermented foods we've touched on fiber but i thought we'd take a closer look um, at probiotics um, um, with more, with greater detail. So um, let's talk about probiotics overall. Like what are they? Most people know they hear that word a lot. Often you see commercials for it. They know somebody who's taking probiotics. They're trying to eat probiotics. So probiotics, the big definition is really just the live bacteria, microorganisms um, that can keep our digestive system healthy but not just our digestive system, more and more research is coming out about the benefits of probiotics um, and a healthy gut with regard to not only immune function, your overall body's immune function, but skin health and even cardiovascular health. So there's a whole lot going on in your belly that's going behind the scenes that you may, uh, you know, that you may not know. So, in a perfect world, we'd be getting these probiotics, this healthy bacteria from our foods. So it's important to know that our bodies, you know, there's good, this is considered the good bacteria and our bodies are going to have a mix of good bacteria, bad bacteria. What you want in that battle is for there to always be the upper hand of the good bacteria. So we'll talk about antibiotics in a second and about the role of probiotic use during antibiotics, uh, a dose of antibiotics. But for right now, many people have general discomfort, maybe gassiness, bloating, um, a feeling of discomfort, GI discomfort on a daily, weekly basis. So for those folks, a diet that is high in uh, foods, containing probiotics or even drinks containing probiotics is really the first start, the best place to go. So are you guys familiar with some of the um, foods and beverages that have probiotics? No, uh, I, yogurt, not. yogurt, definitely. And uh, uh, a lot of fermented yep. products yep. have it. And uh, yeah, I mean, those are the ones I know. I'm sure there's more. So what are they? <laughs> So yogurt, but I have to say there's a caveat there, not all yogurt. So I want you to think best case, plain yogurt, 
unsweetened. Now that is unsweetened with either regular sugar or any of the sugar alternatives. So that means things like monk fruit juice and stevia as well. So I'm talking just plain Greek yogurt. Uh, and you want to look for, now just, I have Faye here. That's just one brand. There are other brands um, obviously out yeah, there. There's a question about that. Is Greek, Greek yogurt the preferable one versus the other yogurts versus like Danon or? Uh, you mean regular, like, traditional, like thinner, plain, thinner, yeah, yogurt. thinner yogurt? Yeah, yeah. Um, they, that will have probiotics as well, but because everything in Greek yogurt is concentrated, these tend to have more added um, uh, probiotics added in after the fermentation process. And that's important to keep in mind. We know that okay, milk products are fermented um, to make things like kefir. That's a beverage that has a lot of probiotics to it. Um, obviously, we mentioned yogurt drinks. In order for, if you just stopped right there with just the fermentation process, the likelihood of those probiotics, remember those, the good bacteria, making it through your stomach acid, and you want that. We want a little bit of stomach acid. It actually helps us. Um, you don't want too much. You don't want none right down the middle. But the likelihood of that small amount of probiotic making it through your stomach alive is very, very low which is why companies like Faye, but there are many others, add additional, um, think of it as an inoculation of more probiotics, and that will always be listed in the ingredient list. I've even noticed on some um, yogurt brands, Faye is not one of them, but that doesn't mean it doesn't contain them, that they'll actually list out um, the, what you wanna look for is the, it's called the colony forming units. CFU. So it will tell you um, how many billion units of the live bacteria are in there. Chobani happens to list it out. I believe they're one brand. The only reason why I'm bringing this up is that it's important to realize that not every fermented food that you are going to eat is going to have live bacteria, good bacteria that will ultimately end up in your small intestine. So you want big numbers, which is why that number, that CFU number should be as high as you possibly can find, or you wanna look for in the ingredient list, a large number of the most popular strains. And I'll talk about those in a second. Yeah, just one thing with yogurt, does that, have, does that have any lactic acid in it? Like milk? I always uh, worry about that. Say one more time. Does that have lactic acid like your milk contains? Uh, most, uh, unless it's a lack, I think you mean, do you mean lactose? Um, yeah. Okay. Lactose. So um, yeah. all of it's going, unless it's a lactose free product, um, it will have lactose in it. But keep in mind that most fermented or cultured dairy foods or drinks have um, some of that lactose broken down. That process of culturing actually helps break down some of the lactose, which is why some folks tolerate yogurt better than they might tolerate a cup of milk or a, a ice cream. Yeah, um, I, I can do well on yogurt, but, uh, you know, have the upset, uh, get upset with milk. Yeah. How, how, Courtney, how, just quickly, how does uh, bacteria get in to your system like that? I mean, how, what are we eating or what are we doing? Or is there anything, I know there's like bad things, E. coli and other stuff, but is it just a natural thing? You know, we have bacteria or is it Absolutely. Some food? Mm -hmm. Yeah, think about it as your natural ecosystem going on in there, right? So um, the whole idea is to preserve that ecosystem the best that you can. So you, we're, we're never going to completely rid ourselves of bad bacteria, um, but um, you want to minimize the amount of that. And the best way to do that is to override the bad with the good. Um, can I can't take so a bad bacteria pill. Uh, you would well. Hopefully, you will not want to take a bad bacteria. Uh, so, the three most common strains that have been, and they're not the only ones. They're, they're just they're just the strains of probiotics that have a great amount of research supporting their effectiveness and use. Um, but they're again, they're not the only ones. But those three, um, and there's different variations of those. But uh, the three that are at the top would be your bifidobacteria. And I want you to think about strains of probiotics as being very 
um, issue specific. And what I mean by that is there is no one size fits all probiotic for whatever issue you're experiencing. So if somebody comes to me and they're having some IBS, irritable bowel syndrome type issues, um, there's a specific group of strains that would be, that are, that research shows is effective for that. The bifidobacteria group happens to be um, that strain that might be most beneficial. Lactobacillus, so that would be typically in a lot of your dairy um, uh, uh, products. And um, I want you to think about this one. It, it is almost always part of the mix when you think about a probiotic being used to help fight the side effects and symptoms of um, uh, being on an antibiotic. And I'm gonna talk about those in a, a little bit more greater detail um, in a second. The last of the, of the three that, again, lots and lots of de um, uh, detailed research supporting its usefulness is the Saccharomyces boulardii. Big long name, you sometimes you'll see them abbreviated um, S. boulardii, you might see L, you know, period instead of the whole lactobacillus um, listed in the ingredient list. But again, these are the three top well studied, different variations. They each have a, a role in how they help. One thing about the, uh, the Saccharomyces, even though it's listed as a, you know, a probiotic, it's technically, well, it's not technically, it is a yeast. So it makes it particularly helpful, uh, uh, its use during antibiotic use. So follow with me on this one. You've got antibiotics on board for whatever, and we know the benefits of antibiotics. If they're used appropriately, they're very, very effective. Typically what you experience are things like GI symptoms, diarrhea, um, and worst case scenario, something called C. difficile, which we've spoken about before. So you want to have the antibiotic do what it's supposed to do, which is knock off the bad bacteria. But in a perfect world, um, you wanna balance out how many good bacteria are also being knocked off. Enter in some of these probiotics. Now, the, the suggestion on when to time it, how to time it is a little mixed. Uh, I've heard everything from start it midway through your antibiotic dose, um, and then more importantly, make sure you're on it for a week after you finish your antibiotic, um, your last antibiotic dose. And then I also see it's fine to start at the exact same time you start your antibiotic, but you don't want to consume them at the same time. So you can see it's a little bit fuzzy when it comes to that role, but suffice to say those, the, the, those that can say, uh, contain that saccharomyces because it's a yeast, might be a better way to go in terms of being uh, beneficial. Mm. So, wow, um, that's a lot. That's a lot. That's a uh, lot. To, uh, it's a uh, lot to digest there, haha. -ha. Well, I know. I know. Uh, it's important because here, this stuff is not. It's. I mean, it's not the most expensive thing that, that can consumers can buy, but it's certainly not inexpensive. And I will say that you want to go with a legitimate brand. And a brand, so, uh, and again, you guys know I don't take any money from anywhere. Align is one of them. Culturel is one of them. There are many brands. Your, your healthcare provider may have a brand that he or she recommends for you to try. But the few things you want to look for, um, and then we're going to talk about foods again, but the few things you want to look for if you're going with a supplement to help you, okay? You want to make sure you're looking at the expiration date. Remember, these are live, right? Mm -hmm. So if it expired two years ago, Chances are, you know, again, it's got to make its way into your intestines intact and alive. And if half of them are dead before they even get into your mouth, you, it's, it's not a good use of your money. So look for that expiration date. Make sure it lists out that there are live cultures in there. You want to look for capsules that may have a delayed release. Why is that helpful? Because we just said that we want to get through the stomach where that very acidic environment is and you wanna to get to the intestine where it can be most beneficial. If you can delay the digestion until it gets down there or it's a, the release till it gets down there, better chances that more of them will make it there alive. Yeah, that, that sounds more, a very science fiction. It's almost like scary. You're, you're eating, you know, you're swallowing the live bacteria that goes into your system. I don't want any live bacteria in my system. I know, it does sound a little freaky, I know. And, um, but you know, for some people, again, um, it's beneficial. I would say before we depart from the from the supplements, at this point, I don't think we have enough research to support 
preventative use of the capsules um, to, you know, long term. It has a role. It has a role in IBS. It has a role during antibiotic therapy. It definitely has a role in uh, preterm infants um, uh, and babies um, in terms of helping them with uh, diarrhea. So lots of solid data on that. In terms of taking it every day, just as part of your normal routine, I don't think we have the data. And like I said, it can get expensive. So I don't know if this is the way to go. I think a better way to go would be take a look at your diet, not just your foods that are high in probiotics, but your diet in general. So you guys mentioned yogurt. We mentioned kefir, um, kimchi. I know we did a show on some kimchi, fermented. sauerkraut, sauerkraut, uh, oh, oh, like anything pickled, right? I think. Yeah. So um, now, we, if you guys remember when I did the pickle, the cucumber right. episode, the pickles that I need were just your quick refrigerator pickles. Those are not a sort, although yummy and delicious, right? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, definitely not, yummy. Not fermented. So not all pickles are fermented. What you mm -hmm. want to keep in mind with things, again, it's still healthy, but if you have sauerkraut and it's the sauerkraut that might have a lot of preservatives in it, that's number one. And two, you are boiling it to death to get it really, really hot. You got no live bacteria left in there. It's still cabbage and it's still healthy, but you've just killed off the bacteria that are in there. You That's just made me think of, of uh, sauerkraut with a uh, over hot dogs. Which yeah. I love. Well. Uh, they can't go well, they, yeah that's that's a good thing sometimes once what in a while happens as one gets older i notice as, as i get older some of the same foods that i had when i was younger now sort of irritate me is, is there something in the, uh, as i get older in my chemical in my body going down to my gut that doesn't let me digest or you know but, uh, or, absolutely i hate um, to say i become gassy and, and of course the, the, yeah. the, the old joke of, uh, you know, as a person gets older, you know, don't stand behind them because they let air out. <laughs> well, thanks, this, Malcolm. <laughs> and on that, it's, it's, now that my, it's my job to talk about poop and gas. Okay. Right. <laughs> right, right. Go, 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 go gas. Right. Um, what, 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 what's the thing they say that's causing some, some of the, uh, the depletion of the ozone layer with cows. That's with methane. That's, that's right. methane. Yeah, that's methane. a whole different topic, you know. Um, different so show. Different if, show. If if you are experiencing, um, so back to the sauerkraut. If you if you yeah. really want the real deal, uh, and this is just one brand, it's Cleveland. It's in the refrigerator section, and it is really just you know cabbage, caraway. There's some, usually some different seasoning, and that is it. Um, it is amazing. It's really yummy. But even that, you don't want to cook it to. If you want that probiotic component to it, you're going to want to have it either cold right from the refrigerator or room temperature or heated just a little bit. If you start boiling it, you're going to kill off the microorganisms in there. So again, still a healthy, you know, a great option because it is cabbage. But if you're going there for probiotic, you want to watch that temperature very, very closely. Now, what, are pre, what are pre, I'm sorry, what are prebiotics? I don't want to miss that. Yeah. What are, so, what are prebiotics? Yeah. So it's the food that probiotics eat. So remember, our <laughs> probiotics need to survive. You're trying to help them along, right? You want to keep that healthy bacteria, the good bacteria going. And the best way to keep them going is to feed them prebiotics. What are the best sources of prebiotics? Many of the foods that we talk about a lot on these segments. So I want you to think about higher fiber foods. Um, foods that contain things like inulin, um, um, we said high fiber, fruits, vegetables, beans, grains. Um, so a lot of these compounds, your vegetable-based compounds, not only do they provide antioxidants, vitamins, and minerals for our overall well-being, but they serve as this incredible prebiotic role for the probiotics. So it's this wonderful feedback that's going on that makes your system work more efficiently keeping you healthier. Hmm. So you can't just, and I see this unfortunately, um, not very often, but I'll see someone wanting to bump up their probiotic intake, either with, you know, kombucha or kaffee or whatever, pick any of the, of the high probiotic, you know, probiotic containing foods or beverages, but they've done nothing to correct the front side of that diet. And unfortunately, 
you will not see those incredible benefits of what the probiotics can do if you're not supporting it with that high prebiotic, that overall healthy diet. So you, what other foods are you eating? Are you eating a lot of processed food? Are you eating a ton of red meat? Um, if you are eating um, vegan or vegetarian, is it also very, very processed? So you really must take a closer look at all of the foods you're eating if you're trying to create an overall healthier gut and then immune system. And you know, if we're following the data, you know, good skin health and cardiovascular health as well. Yeah, when, when people eat, uh, eat salads, is, would it be healthier to eat a cabbage salad versus a lettuce salad? Oh gosh, I never discourage anybody from eating salads, period. So yeah. I'm going to say, eat the salad that you will enjoy the most, that you are more likely going to eat more of. Having said that, if you're, because we, we, always, we always go to poop, gas, we always kind of feel, but I got a lot of clients who come to me, it's like, I'm gassy, I'm distended, I'm bloated. And beyond just being an aesthetic, people don't like feeling like, I've had some people call it their, their food their food baby, um, where like after they eat, they get really, really bloated. So a couple of suggestions would be, first of all, keep a food record for a few days. You don't have to do this long-term, but it's important to figure out if there is one food or a group of foods that might be particularly problematic for you. So keeping a food record, you might be able to identify, you know what, I'm experiencing this after I eat XYZ salad or after I eat some other food. And then it's able, you're able to, uh, to, to pull it out and see if the symptoms resolve and then you've identified it. So food records would be the first thing to help identify any triggers. Taking a look at the environment in which you eat. Are you eating when you're stressed? Um, are you taking in a lot of air when you eat? So you're talking a lot while you're eating, maybe a lot of carbonated beverages. No, there's nothing wrong with seltzer. You guys have heard me talk about that. But for some people that extra gas is contributing to some of this um, distension. Is it occurring after a very fatty meal or a hot processed food meal? Again, this all has to be identified. Um, no. To you know, which, which help, which may may or may not help. You, you're going to identify it um, and then work backwards from there. When I know we did our segment on FODMAPs. I think you guys remember that mm -hmm. for some individuals, there could be. Uh, a um, category within that FODMAP group that may be contributing to some of the distension and gas that you're experiencing. So it's important to be able to you know, identify that. We won't go into it too um, great detail today. We'll save it for a separate episode, but there's something called SIBO, which stands for small intestine bacterial overgrowth which could be contributing to some of these um, gas issues, um, whether it be you know, through the mouth or you know, the other direction. So identify those, try to eliminate that food or minimize it. Sometimes it's not the food alone, it's how much you're eating it. So a half cup might be fine, but once you go cross over and maybe now you're eating a cup of it or a cup and a half of it, then you might start to see these symptoms. So right. that's where the food logs are really helpful. Should, should, I mean, so when, at what point in time, if you, if it's really bothering you, you're getting like stomach pain, you're getting, you know, a lot that's really giving you issues. When should you then go to a doctor? I mean, at what point do you do that? Yeah. So I mean, assuming that you are not, you know, doubled over in pain, um, I would say that if you try to take a look at the diet, try some, uh, you know, making some revisions, um, doing certain teas and things like that, like those, those teas that are, they help with gas relief. Um, so like um, peppermint, chamomile, fennel, anise-based teas. Um, if you're trying that and you're still not seeing any relief, I would say that's a time to call your doctor. Now, for some people that might be in a few weeks, I would say to never let an issue like this 
um, go on for greater than you know six weeks to, um, or so, because sometimes that distension and that bloatingness um, could be, and this is not always, but um, it happens to be one of the symptoms of something like ovarian um, uh, cancer, which as you both know, doesn't have many um, signs or symptoms. So that's not one, particularly obviously in women that you want to push out very long without getting it checked out. Um, so that the hardest thing to do is, uh, you know, you go to the doctor and they say, well, uh, the problem is you're too tense, you're too nervous, you're too worried, relax. Well, how much does attention and uh, being nervous, how much of this, uh, you know, go, uh, you know, work against you and, and give you all these cramps and gas and, you know, et cetera? Um, I think it depends on the person, Malcolm, right? I mean, I know some people that they're just easy breezy. They just, you know, they, they handle stress a little bit differently. Um, I, I'm not one of them. By the way, but, Me either. Um, <laughs> um, so, but there's, there's certainly a link between your overall stressful environment, not just while you're eating, but the stress you're under overall in your life and how it affects um, your digestive system. So for some people that might mean diarrhea, for some people it means constipation, for some people it you know, a lot loss of appetite or they eat more. Um, and if they're eating more, odds are it might not be the greatest stuff. So they might get that gassiness and bloating. So many of us need to get a handle on our stress levels, um, but that's very individual. And it might just mean that the first steps could be things like, eliminating some of these stressors at the very least while you're eating and then work backwards from there. What are the things that are causing the most stress in your world right now? Is there any way to adjust them? If the answer is yes, try to adjust them. If the answer is leave the country. No, yeah, leave the country. <laughs> if the answer is no, then you have to, the best thing you can do is focus on your internal stress management. And we've spoken about exercise, meditation, better sleep, things like that. And stay away from stay away hundreds. from ghost stay away from ghost peppers now, now they say when, you're, when your <laughs> that's body, it they say when your body is under stress it releases some a hormone called cortisol yes what how does this have to do with uh, digestion if you release cortisol um you no know, if it's just cortisol alone that's just one we hear that you know that is everyone hears that knows that is the stress hormone yeah. um it's, it's, it's really more the how your overall digestive enzymes, um, how, remember, like I said, some people have a stressful gut that they tend to go to the bathroom very quickly after they've eaten. Some people work the other way. So this is back to our, you know, our initial topic of probiotics, where probiotics and the good and, and the role of healthy bacteria in the gut is helping your body digest those foods as efficiently as possible. So even if you are under stress, your body is working as hard as it can to make sure that food is moving through your system, moving through your digestive system as efficiently as it can be. We don't want it rushing through so that you're malabsorbing and you're not getting any nutrients, nor do we want it sitting in your gut and then your intestines for a very long amount of time. There's this middle, like this sweet spot right down the middle. Probiotics support that environment, no matter what stressor um, might be uh, in your world. Mm, sounds sounds like a good path to take and to uh, to, to to look for that good uh, sauerkraut. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> what are the what are the natural foods would be good for probiotics? Um, so, okay, so we mentioned kefir, we mentioned the sauerkraut, we mentioned um, kimchi, cottage cheese, certain, cottage cheese. Che certain cheeses, because of the way that they are cultured, will have a certain amount of probiotics to them, not all of them. Um, cottage cheese, I know, is one of them. I've even seen um, mozzarella, but it's really, you want to think about, forget polio, and I'm not slamming, I happen to be a mozzarella snob, but um, it, it's it's the cheese that has had um, the least amount done to it, and there aren't any preservatives added after that. So think about fresh mozzarella is what I'm trying to say. M Murray's cheese in Grand Central I used to be a, a, a stop for me all the time. The cheese was just fabulous. Yeah. But what about um, kombucha? That seems to be like a, a thing now also. 
And yeah. that's for probiotics. Like people are, you know, getting, getting that in the stores now. And, and is that yeah. something good? Sure, sure. And they have great flavor. So it's, if you remember kombucha, I know we spoke about uh, these before, it's fermented black or green tea. And uh, you'll know you have the right stuff because when you open the lid, it'll almost be like seltzer and you'll get that bubbly, like, so that effervescence that comes out of it. So absolutely a great option for you. But I would say that you really want to choose the ones that are already prepared. I do know some folks who make their own kombucha, which is fine. I think people who know what they're doing. Uh, it's, it's excellent and it needs to live in your refrigerator, but remember that that good bacteria can very quickly convert into bad bacteria that can make you quite sick if you make kombucha tea and leave it out on your counter longer than it really should be. So, yeah, Guys, guys I, I hate to tell you this, but my director just said it's time to cut. Oh my God. <laughs> I just got All the right. cut side. No, allowed, not allowed, not allowed. No. But anyway, kombucha, oh. back to you. Kombucha is absolutely fine. Um, and there's some great flavors. So there's probably a flavor. If you're new to probiotics, there's probably a flavor that you will like. You might just need to experiment. With. Actually, fascinating topic. I think we could spend another two hours on it. But and Max, you have to take us out. I do. I will. Okay. So probiotics, a good thing. Uh, so thanks for joining us for Courtney on Health. To get more info, follow Courtney on her Facebook page, which is Courtney on Health, on Instagram at CLG Wellness, now on TikTok, woo, and uh, visit her website, CourtneyGravenese.com. For more shows, go to MalcolmPresents.com and TheManyShadesOfGreen.com. Um, you're listening to Courtney on Health, Smart Sound Nutrition, Strong Safe Fitness, and we will catch you again next time. See you next time. Bye. And go to MalcolmPresents.com to see all the back shows. So you see all the shows that we had on probiotics. And every time I see, hear probiotics, I want to know if there's amateur biotics. No. Anyway. <laughs> oh, Bye, guys. What a, what a comedian. Bye. 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 Have a great week. Bye.